We live in a world where a company bought for 120 million uses the word fam in their emails. Personally, I find it cringy as fuck, but you do you, boo boo. I'm joined today with Tom Larman, aka former Tom, the first cannabis farmer to have a government study done on his farm. And today we're going to have a legacy cannabis conversation. What up, Tom? Not much, Maggie. How you doing, buddy? All right. Yeah, I was going to do the bomber, but like you know, this is all new to us too, right? Where like, I, I I get that we're we're getting like a little bandwidth and following and shit, but like, uh, I think each segment deserves like things like this deserve its own special little bumper. So when we get to that level, we'll do it. But like, you know, until then, uh, man, I've known you since goddamn, like I've seen you at the farmer's markets back when we used to have cannabis farmer's markets. And, uh, you know, there was the one in black diamond. That was my favorite one that, and I saw you, at the um one in um was it sunshine yeah or, sunshine uh, tacoma yeah um uh, yeah the world famous medical marijuana farmers market and then black diamond was a regular and i used to bounce around pop around from you know every weekend i do a different one so i wasn't at the same one all the time but yeah those were the days right well i mean there's a, that was like a uh you were like a staple in as far as like um you know like back then, uh, you know, it's kind of it was nice to kind of cool to see like local branding, like like that was like it no matter what. Guys, from Tacoma, people from uh, you know Yelm, you know, all over these uh, Washington State would come, and then you would have all the other t- people coming in, like just to experience the weed that was coming in. I know the, at the time too, I never foresaw like the whole business side of things, like the um mso or multi-state or, or or even the branding thing right i never thought that really in my vision i only saw we had medical and we had uh uh it was kind of like a libertarian type market right where anybody can grow as long as you had uh, uh the the medical script you had a collective everybody was trying to do what uh we talk is a uh, uh the, the the medical defense right it's just an affirmative defense it's not right. a real law it's just a uh, uh, hey, we're trying to do the law, but this is what you've given us. And, and that was so cool to see people who like stepped up and did a thing. I mean, how big it because you haven't grown in a while, though. You've been doing more consulting these days. But like when you were in, when you had your field to dream, like how, what was your biggest grow at the time on your farm? Oh, on my farm, it was actually the the year 2015 when uh, the feds came to my farm and I was able to educate uh, seven agents from the CDC and then and then they came for the actual study in October where we harvested for a day and big leaf. The next day we did a lot of bucking and the third day we did trimming. Mm. But yeah, that was my biggest grow. I think I had 120 plants that year. Damn. And when they were there too. So my farm was like a secure location where federal agents can learn, touch, and study cannabis. Mm. So when I first got on the phone with them, they I, I was on the phone from 10 agents from the CDC. I said, like, where are you getting your information? They go, Oh, YouTube, YouTube. And I said, Well, that's really not fair to our industry. Man. You know, and so I, I invited them to for a tour eventually, and then You know, the DOJ said, no way. Their lawyer said, no way. We can't have our agents go into these legal operations, but we can make your farm a secure location where federal agents can learn, touch, and study cannabis. And I said, okay. And they said, well, we're going to have to do a big dive. And I said, dive deep. You know, me and my wife have always done our best to to play by the rules that were given to us at the time. Right. Well, that's the whole point of this, like, this, like, uh, legalization thing. You know, I remember when it was medical, like, you know, there's always the the anti argument of why it shouldn't be. For whatever reason, people have this like up their butt thinking like uh, growers, farmers, uh, uh, they just want to be legit business people, right? They're just trying to be part of a, uh, whatever's available to them. And, and you know, the market's always there. It's just a matter of like, I want to play by the rules. Like, you don't want to pay 25% tax like Washington State does. Like, that, nobody wants that. that that's no. not good. That's not fair. But like, it's still also, that's the, it feels like the protection fee, right? Like that these guys just so they don't get fucked with in the state. Like, like, even though now I know they're starting to learn price points. Like I've gotten some pretty cheap weed that was pretty decent out here nowadays. And I never thought it was going to get to that point. Cause I remember 
uh, the medical days where I, man, I'd be buying uh, ounces, quarters for for like you know I'm a I'm a paycheck to paycheck guy. You know that's right. that's that's how I live. And so like whenever the whatever little money I lot to myself, it's like it's gonna be weed or beer or whatever. And the, the 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 beer the weed dollar stretched way much more back then as far as the quality went. Like as an asthmatic too, because you know it is uh, a medicinal. It's it is medicine. You know as much as People, you know, we, 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 we treat this, the whole recreational is to get free out of jail car, but it is medicine. I mean, you've seen people, you've helped people like tailor their, their needs to the plan. And, uh, uh, but the, 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 the ugly part is the, the business side, the rules side. And, you know, that's funny because I, I, I'm glad you mentioned how the CDC was part of your thing, but wasn't there, there was also, um, other portions, but, uh, it was such at a time though, at the time there were still like raids and shit going on in Washington state. Right. Like I remember some of the, uh, like on Facebook, you know, there was a lot of, uh, that's when it really was a community, I believe, because like when the feds were coming in and they started raiding from the South and then someone's like alerting people like, Hey, you know, and then stores would shut door, you know, in Seattle here. Uh, I know people were like, I go to buy my, 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 my weekly weed. And I'm like, Oh, fuck. Free shops are closed today because say uh, they got a Facebook warning about a raid. It's a, and then, uh, but how did you? Uh, I mean, you kind of like dealt with the government as far as like so you felt pretty much like a little safer, huh? Didn't you at that time? Or yeah, well, still? we had we had done a lot of work with Como News. I can't remember how many pieces I did with Como News. I did a bunch with uh, here in Vancouver with the Columbia newspaper and Zane Vorenberg. And I'd done a bunch of, of media stuff. I was all about getting out there and getting in front of the camera and really normalizing the, the plan and normalizing cannabis, you mm -hmm. know, just kind of putting a different face out there that I wasn't some, you know, gangster type guy yeah. out there. You know, me and my wife have, you know, I've been patient for, well, since 97. And, you know, we legalized in California medical Prop 215, which I fought for. And then mm -hmm. I finally got my, you know, my, my medical permit from Dr. Eidelman in Los Angeles. Now he was a legend down there. He used to take care of all of Jack Carrere's patients down there mm. too. So we had a collective and we had 20 patients, we got raided. And uh, when we got raided, my wife, we had a uh, Brownie Mary, I think today's her birthday, but oh, Brownie yeah. Mary, uh, she she taught us all about the importance of bringing the media in when there's a raid. So what we had was, was we all had media lists. And when the cops showed up, my wife, Damn. you know, she moved, you know, several, you know, uh, laundry baskets with laundry on top, but weed on the bottom down to the yeah. common space and then got on her cordless phone and called all the news stations before he knew it, they were all there because we were really visible there in San Diego too. Again, yeah. trying to normalize. We go to the town council meetings with our four inch plant, put it up there and tell them how safe cannabis was. They used to roll their eyes. But after the raid, when we showed up, you know, we had uh, Michael Bartelmo. He was our, uh, he he's a quadriplegic in San Diego, a real famous guy down there, super okay. good friend of mine. But, you know, in the head, headlines of the paper, Michael Bartelmo approached the stand and all you could hear is the world of the wheelchair as it approached the stand. So mm. we had, a, we were um, very vocal and, and just, just trying out there, out there to normalize the plan and, and make it yeah. look like, like the, not like this gangster thing. And more and, like it's, you know, just regular people. We had 12 yeah. patients, AIDS patients, old people with arthritis and glaucoma. Um, you know, we had the gamut. I mean, that, that, that is a horrible media thing. Like, I, 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 that's one of the things, like, like, like I do advocate is, like, uh, well, you know, Tom, my, my, my partner, uh, when he came back in the glory days of Hempfest, um, he came out one time. And uh, uh, I was like, see, man, this is. The most uh, the most awesome thing I thought about Hempfest was it was a mile and a half of just like shit, like a mile and a half of people selling stuff, and you were left alone to your own accord, just to smoke a joint and enjoy the sun and the day. But uh, I was like, see, man, this is all I'm much to do about nothing. It's like not gangster, and what makes a gangster is the laws, right? Like, right. like that's how you recoup your costs. Sometimes, I mean, right? You know, we're we're now like. The whole point of legalizations is to be in this like civility, the civil, you know, like 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 
when I went to MJ Biz in the intro, when I when I when I said that it was the mentioned the hundred twenty million dollar company, it was that was MJ Biz. So like MJ Biz got bought for one hundred twenty million, right? I, I mean, you can look it up; it's out there. That's where I got my information, at least the internet. And uh, uh, I imagine like some of it was like was like uh, stock options or whatever. I mean, it's still going to be a good uh, thing, right? This event was six, I think. Football fields uh, space if it took up so a lot oh, of shit. It's huge. Right? It's huge. Yeah. And then and then and then uh, uh, and it's legit business. Like I like when I was there, I mean it was still kind of like the car show vibe where the booty girls were selling tax income revenue right. whatever's. And you're like, I get it. It's a bunch of horny accountants coming by, but like you know, overall that's just business in general. No matter what it was, it could have been tech. It could have been whatever. And and. and I think there's still going to be the evolution as each state come down until the federal shit happens. Right. Like there's still going to be this like clusterfuck of individual little fiefdoms and everything. But I think your, your vision though, like having the, the ergonomic study done, right. That that's the kind of shit like, like workers rights and protections. When I 502 happened, I, then I I vote two for people who don't know is the rule of the law here that that's the, the recreational law. Uh, it happened and it gave people a chance, but what I thought most importantly, what it did was it gave workers rights, right? Like right. back when it was uh, dispensaries, pot shops, uh, you didn't get uh, paid time off. There wasn't medical and all the other crap. I mean, if there was, I mean, I guess you might've got like really lucky with somebody really kind and smart like that, but like for the most part, not. And now because of 502, there's all that business adherence bullshit, but the, the nail in the medical coffin was SB 5052, which, right. uh, you know, that that was the one that really uh, uh, closed the uh, the culture, I guess. I remember it well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shops closed up faster. <laughs> as soon as 5052 hit, man, that was was crazy to see how fast. 502 hit. No one, everyone, everyone was like, cool. You keep your, uh, your recreational weed over there. Uh, we won't let people in unless they have a script. Um, and, and then of course the, the quirky, like, uh, uh, well now we're going to offer medical weed in the stores, but, uh, you get tax free. I mean, it was all bullshit anyways, the structure of the patients versus what they had. I mean, I know they're trying better now for it and, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever going to get, cause what, what we had before was, I believe ideal capitalism, but they just didn't really work on like regulate themselves, right? Like the the whole regulation thing is a is kind of a funnel part of this like legalization thing. Like so, and, and, and to that sense, because you're part of the you, you were uh, involved with the the recent death, right? With the the young lady on the East Coast. Yeah, Lorna Oxford. McMurray up there in Massachusetts. Yeah, I was on a podcast, and then from the podcast, uh, a big magazine, a big like uh, I don't want to. I'll just say Leafly got in touch with me and they said, hey, you know, you seem to be the guy uh, who's worked on this before. So would you like to work on this interview we're doing? And I said, sure. So uh, at that point, you know, they were all saying the big MSOs are saying, hey, there's no standards. There's no nothing. You know, it's a brand new industry kind of playing dumb. So I got, got on the phone and called my buddies at CDC NIOSH and and I became really good friends with them. Uh, them. They, we get, we're in touch constant, not constantly, but every few months we talk to each other. We text each other at Christmas and the holidays, check on our, our on our families. They really became friends with us. So mm. when this was going on, I just said, you know, James, what do you think? And he says, well, you know, I'll do it. You know, just get me in touch with the people. So he he got involved, and he said, if three or more employees have an issue or see a dangerous situation, all they have to do is call this phone number or this email address and your employers can't fire you, demote you or treat you unreasonable uh, because you're doing this. So, yeah. you know, they, they've they uh, seen a big uptick in it. And yeah, it was I'm just, you know, out there making sure because in the cannabis industry, we well know right now, like every young kid in the world wants to jump in and pretend like there's some sort of pioneer in the industry, you know, <laughs> get in there, I'm a pioneer and we're doing this and, uh, but it, they'll work for nothing and they'll work in really b bad conditions. They'll be totally taken advantage of. 
and the yeah. owners know the operators know hey if we get rid of this guy there's 50 more lined up pounding on the door wanting that cannabis job yeah, so i yeah. wanted to make sure that these that these people were taken care of and properly treated and not you know not abused like lorna mcmurray i mean they weren't even given proper pe ppe she didn't yeah. she wasn't even given a paper mask not even a cheap one let huh. alone like an n90 well then that was after complaints too right like didn't yeah. she already file complaints about breathing issues and was kind of gaffed off throughout the whole thing uh yeah and then she got asphyxiated and died so and that's and that's horrible that should never happen yeah but uh i'm happy what? that you know i was able to bring some people in with authority and and let you know the the workers out there know that there there's you know governmental agencies are there to work with you to make sure that you're not abused that's kind of the funny thing right like i i, I kind of like laugh at how this 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 way this 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 legalization thing goes right like like uh before back in the day um when i used to sell weed um a, i sold in college like i sold to college kids so it was like very not scary right i wasn't like on the street selling whatever and nothing um but like you'd never really want to put yourself out there right you never wanted to put your name you did if you knew my name i did something wrong right like that right. was <laughs> you know i mean you know i can sell you all the packs you want but like uh you know these these fucking kids with these uh call you know here's my telegram my snapchat my my uh, uh uh my instagram uh you know it's gonna bite you in the ass it's gonna freaking i mean it's the the i hate to say it but like the portions of the government don't like success and that portion is the one that puts you in jail right the, the the judicial part whereas there are parts that like uh 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 the it was osha and uh, uh yeah. scientists and and those guys they write the the reports and then osha takes them and make the laws out of them yeah so, so i mean they're actually looking for like workers uh, uh you know as long as it's legal in that state with a a, a worker uh, regulated type scenario right no workplace health them. and safety standards are huge yes yeah and no, no, that's that's something i give to the legalization as far as like uh no matter how bad I think the the law is here with the high taxes and uh, the lack of limited, uh, uh, I was like, I love how Portland doubled theirs. Like last year, we have still yet. We went through a pandemic and we don't have fucking delivery yet. Like I, I mean, we got so many issues here in Washington State, but you know, and and and, and they're doing all this like stroking of the like we're going to do social equity or we're going to do. Uh, uh, I think what's the, what's the other one that they got? Like they're uh, they're they're trying to go through a couple of motions, but like. If it's anything like home grow, I, I don't really see them being any sort of like champion of the plan or the or the people as far as like uh, the law goes. It, it it's it's whatever. It's, it's profit driven for the state, yes. no doubt about it. You know, and they've kept it. They've intentionally kept it that way. Yeah, I mean, I myself are gonna like hopefully uh, once I get my license, uh, it's gonna be. It's like a messed up lottery ticket where. As long as we put it in the right place, the the store is guaranteed to pull revenue because it's the only game in town. Which is my bad. I mean, like I, I'm lucky enough to win, and I hope to to champion more things for like what what can be better. Unfortunately for Illinois, I'm fortunate to live with our messed up law here in Washington State. Um, but you know, let's go back to like the legacy time, dude. What after you 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 ran away from uh, uh, California to, for your survival, pretty much. I mean, like, because you 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 beat the case and then took off. Is that what, what happened, or did you guys still like had a case well, pending? Well, you like, know, I could go I could go way back. You know, when I was sixteen, I got busted in Ocean Beach parking lot just, on just a weird a weird anomaly. Mm -hmm. There was some sort of sting operation, and me and my buddy were surfing, and we oh came out God. of the water and we put the boards on my you know on my car and this guy kept on hassling me going hey do you got any weed do you got to get i'm going yeah i think so you know i may have a tie stick in here or something you know <laughs> it's not like i was out there sl slinging it and yeah. then i whipped out the tie stick and on went the handcuffs and fuck we got you know hauled away to some you know substation and then from yeah. there they took us downtown and Man, it was a bummer because my parents said, well, you have tickets to see Led Zeppelin. 
We got to no. do something. You're not going to go see Led Zeppelin. You're going to have to give your ticket away. And I was like, damn. damn. <laughs> I mean, that's just so, so many levels of that story, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then from there, when we got busted in San Diego, um, they gave us all our grow equipment back. And then we popped up a grow room in Michael Bartelmo's uh, living room in his one bedroom apartment there in Hillcrest. I built the walls and put the electrical in. We hung a light. He called the the chief of police and said, are you going to bust me in the chief's hall? No, Michael, don't worry. We're not going to bust you. You know, so we grew it up. We got uh, mm. clones from all the other growers in the county, donated a bunch of clones to us, and we, we finished it up. But by the time we went to court, uh, normal, it was high profile case. So we had free lawyers from normal. Okay. They jumped in to uh, make sure the case went right. And right before mm. the court case, we had a big march downtown San Diego where my wife, who's a nurse, she was in her little nurse's outfit. And we had people running around signs, the whole nine yards. They mm. didn't drop the case, but they just put, they just didn't charge us at that time. They were waiting okay. for us to, to make another mistake. And wow. from that point, I stayed there about another, this was in 99. I stayed there till about 2020, uh, at 2000 and late 2001. And uh, we moved to Williams, Oregon, mm. where I ended up in, just by fluke, I ended up in Williams, Oregon, which I don't know if everybody knows, but it's kind of like the Garberville, Humboldt of Oregon, okay. you know, it's tucked oh, wow. away way back in the Siskiyou Mountains. No, uh, we had a we had a great experience there. I was a farm manager on an organic seed farm, and uh, we grew a couple plants up in the in the hills there that were given to us. And you know, hmm. uh, it was a good deal. Well, so what made you guys go to Washington then? Uh, well, I couldn't make any money down there. It was really tight, and we wanted to buy our own farm. I wanted mm. to do regular farming and grow cannabis. So I got a job up here in Portland at Mr. Sun Solar, and he told me, Tom, go go across the river in Washington. Get more bang for your buck up there. The taxes aren't as gnarly as Oregon is. And so we ran, our third place was this uh old nursery that was going up for sale. So it had two wells. Mm you know, five 100 foot greenhouses, uh, just water every or one inch or three inch main lines everywhere where spigots were in direct burial. And it was like a dream come true. Damn. But, so that's how we, that's how we ended up here. I just, I, I, um, what, how did you get involved? Like, like when the medical market out here kind of slowly grew, like for, I first moved out here, I got out of the Navy and, 97 i worked at raytheon for uh three years and then i came out here uh, uh no i joined in 97 i smoked a lot of weed drink uh 2007 is when i got out 2010 is when i came here um and then when i got here uh it, i found it funny because i didn't realize when i uh, was serving up i was i, I was stationed up in uh, whidbey island that they had medical marijuana at the time like i didn't I was trying to find weed like on my long extended leave times, but I could right. never find weed. And, and uh, you know, I think part of it's just because I, I have a small circle. You know, it's mostly just like my family, uh, the kids, and then like, you know, military. Right. Uh, but when I got out, um, I moved out here in 2010 and learned about it. I was like, oh, I just need to get a script. So I went to some weird ass. And that's the, the convoluted thing about the evolution of this process, this, this legalization thing was. I helped get signatures for Prop 215. You had some sort of medical uh, thing going on there. And then out here, we got the medical thing. But then to see the actual evolution of how, like when I first got my script, it was very sporadic, right? And there was like different medical providers. Um, there was no cohesive, like, this is the actual medical script. Um, when uh, uh, Tom, talking to Tom, there, and he's in Illinois. And their uh, medical program, they had an actual, like, regulated, um, if you get a script, you're in a system, right? And here in Washington State, very libertarian, very, uh, you know, but also conservative. You know, the Northwest is fucking weird. Right. <laughs> but, but, like, 
you know, because you think it's like some sort of hippie liberal like utopia, but then you got like uh, people playing war games in the back corner somewhere. Um, but like during that time, so I got this medical script out here uh, somewhere in the West Seattle, and then I would have to go to a store and uh, uh, they would call it in. So hopefully the fucking place where I got the script was open so they could answer the phone and be like, yeah, you're in a database. So you're you're a patient, you know, and that was very rigor more just for the store. And you as a, a as a farmer, is that, that's one of the things I saw was was people who grew in some places, some places had clones. And I thought that's kind of that's kind of cool. Uh, if I could buy a clone, grow it, then I could come back to the pot shop and sell back the weed that I just grew. Right. I, about, I mean, I never did that, but I saw people selling pounds and opening packs and, and going through kind of like. You see in uh, um, what was that Discovery show with uh, D'Angelo when he went over that his original uh, 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 Harborside, clothes. yeah, Harborside. They there's footage of them like opening the bags and I mean that shit. You just witness it like at the counter, you know. They were just like right. check. And, and so like, did you already have a network? I mean, Washington State has a legacy grower system, you know, like with the Humboldt days, like even before medical, there were. There are high time cup winners of Vashon and different parts of uh, of, uh, of Washington State. Just they pop out of nowhere for me sometimes. There's like, yeah, I've been growing since blah blah blah. Jack Harry, you know, and I'm like, holy fuck, <laughs> you know. That's right. what I say. Like, no, the whole point of like being a good whatever you're doing is no one knows who you are. But now right. we're in this almost day and age of like, fucking look at me, you know. <laughs> you gotta have a brand. Right. <laughs> well, all that cookies. stuff was all that stuff was changing, you know. When I got up here. <laughs> You know, I started looking into their medical marijuana program because I grew in San Diego and we were farming and we were selling vegetables and I was growing for myself and a couple of patients. And then I heard about the Tacoma, um, the Tacoma market. And mm. I said, well, I better go check that out. Back then, I co-wrote a book called Cannabis, Cannabis Consumers Guide that basically was uh and i did a lot of book signings that's why i was able to float from market to market and okay. the way i was able to do it is because i didn't i was uh yeah we were we were promoting the book all over the place so sure. it was it, it was good way to to get involved and then i started slowly bringing my flower to the to the events and selling it and you know that's that's kind of how i made the the transition you know into what we you know what we had what we had up there and i really i really enjoyed growing and you know we always were patient centric so we really wanted to make sure that me and my wife had our meds and then we wanted to make sure that a small group of friends who needed their meds had their clean meds too because you really never mm. know even at the farmer's market what you were getting because yeah. there are so many people out there either growing packs to get rid of and god knows what they were spraying on it back then and you yeah. know it was a mess and i was all about grow your own you know i was always oh, about yeah. home grow and grow your own and take care of yourself and yeah so what? that's uh you know and then you know a bunch of stuff happened you know we were able to educate through como news we were able to educate uh the the government when they were making up their rules about concentrates here in washington state uh, mm. matt markovich who from como news who i work with a bunch he asked yeah. me, well, Farmer Tom, will you do an open blast? I said, sure, I'll do an open blast for you. But then I thought about it. Man, the legislator's making up, you know, all the rules for cannabis, and they're not going to allow concentrates. This is bad. Because at yeah. the time, people were blowing themselves up, and houses were exploding all over the place. And it was a mess. But the legislators, you really got to know about any legislators across the country. You got to educate them and educate them and educate them oh, yeah. because they don't know anything at all. So my deal was, okay, I'm going to bring in the best. So I brought in farmer Joe Parker. I brought in Joe Wynn, probably the <laughs> best open blaster in Oregon. I brought Jonah Tacoma in. We brought all, and the thing was, is we wanted to make a good impression. So first I yeah. made everybody take their big hats off. And so we didn't look like a bunch of gangsters. And yeah. then our the message we wanted to get across, if you don't tax it and regulate it, these explosions will still happen. It's a hundred dollar yeah. fix to buy a tube, you know, a zip tie, 
uh, coffee filter, can of butane, some Pyrex, and man, you're in business, you know? Yeah. yeah. So no, uh, but that's how people were killing themselves. But our message was, if you don't tax it or regulate it, you're still going to see this. So within two weeks of the media piece going out, they ch quickly changed their minds. And mm. now we had uh, legal concentrates. And that's what subsequently led me to work with the federal government is all of oh, my wow. media exposure. Yes, totally. Well, you you turned me on to to to, to Matt with uh, when the the last market was raided, yeah, uh, t two times ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and I and I think they're finally out. I don't know, but um, but yeah, no, uh, so but you're not doing any uh, medical or not. I mean, you're doing your own personal. And that you know, that's the other thing too. I, I'm glad you mentioned how clean medicine because, like, I think overall, like, just like medical grade. And I think people have this perception of just like sterile shit all the time where like medical can also be just the way it's just done properly as far as like purging and feeding and all the other things that come along with this plant. You know, like uh, people want to go to fucking drive through McDonald's. They want to go slaughter the cow and do all the shit that they got to do to get, you know, they have a hamburger. They just want to drive through. And I think overall, like Washington State, we have the shittiest uh, testing requirement. Um, I, you know, if you're familiar where medical gets all the good testing, all the testing, and then recreational gets like the bare minimum, I think it's just right. two percentages or whatever. Dumb, dumb. Like why, you know, it should be just even keel. Uh, uh, it's a plant, it's consumable. It's a thing that we all should, uh, you know, be, uh, like you said, education, you know, uh, it's not just the highest THC, it's a, a, a entourage effect, terpenes and all the flavonoids involved. That's it's, what it's about. Yeah, to get that high or the experience rather, you know, because wood is high. That that I hate to use that word high per se, you know. Right. Like, but uh, it's all um, about the terpenes. It's really I like an eighteen yeah. percent, sixteen to eighteen is fine for me. But okay. with the broad terpene, what I'm smoking right now is some amnesia haze. Has been my wife's and a farm favorite forever. We just recently got a cut back last year, and now okay. I know why I missed it so much, man. It just it clicks mm. you right in, man. I love those old OG strains, and Amnesia Haze was always one of our favorites, and to get it back has been a super blessing. We're really enjoying the heck out of it this year. That's 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 the beauty of, like, uh, like growing, and you understand more, you know, and I just happen to have friends that grow. Uh, this is from a, a, a Mexican brickweed that uh, John Kingsbury grew for me. I, so I have these nice. seeds. Yeah, I have seeds that I've been holding on from Tucson for, like, eight years. And uh, nice. I was like, dude, I don't know if they're alive or not, but uh, he he got a big ass plant. <laughs> I was like, sweet, nice. good, so, yeah. So like, yeah, and again, done right. Um, so uh, what are you doing now today? Since you're not, because you stopped. Did you you stopped growing when when five hundred two happened, right? Because you probably you didn't get a license. No, we didn't or? stop. We didn't stop growing. We just kept on with our. You know, I just grow four fucking massive plants. <laughs> well, I mean, personal grows. Is he right? Yeah, or? so it's a seasonal yeah. grow. And, you know, we just mm. take care of me and my family. And uh, that's, that's, you awesome. know, that's really what it's all about. You know, it's uh, the winter yeah. time right now. And I've been doing a lot of reflection. And I posted something yesterday. And it, I was thinking about, man, when you first started, what was like your goals? And I thought, wow. wow. Yeah, when I first started, I just wanted to grow good weed, smoke it, and not get busted. Right. And anything beyond that, you know, who knows what is going on. But if I had that, if I could grow my plants, smoke my own weed without getting busted, then it was a win. And so I, I kind of think it's all a win at this point, as long as you're able to, you know, I know there's no home grow here in Washington, but it's, you know, but if, you know, I go get a card every year, I see my doctor and I... You know, I get my, you know, four plant card. And sure. uh, so I just, yeah, I don't, it's all for personal. And that's basically what I, the original deal was to grow our yeah. own, grow our own food, drink clean water, eat clean food, buy right. beans from my local neighbors, get eggs from my neighbor, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff because the health is the only thing we really have. And everything else is so profit driven out there. You know, yes. money, money, money. How's the best? How can we make the most money, money, money? And generally, making a lot of money means cutting a lot of corners. 
to, oh, yeah. the, quali to the quality, you know, we're going to start growing with salts instead of organically we're gonna mm. you know we're gonna start taking all of these you know shortcuts we're gonna yeah. you know we can we'll get into the whole hemp thing in, in in a little bit but that whole thing and isolating all these cannabinoids and you know this yeah uh, you know the whole delta nine delta eight and delta nine and you know it's just a big it's craziness going on I think a lot of that, uh, so like TACA, the Delta 9G8 thing is definitely just semantical, I think, for for most part. Like when it comes to consumer, because like, I mean, if you're going to get some flour, because it's almost like the, because, you know, the hemp is giving like this weird ass, like people are, it's kind of like medical in Washington State when it was medical, where I think you got to have some sort of cojones to, to say, hey, I'm going to put a shit ton of money in this thing, then market it, sell it, and then uh get your money back right because like i remember when uh prop 215 came about and then people were doing collectives one of the biggest things that were people were arguing about was like these people are fucking making money how how, how is this how is this non-profit how is this a uh, uh when this guy's uh uh eating you know what i mean it's like you know the farmer should be allowed to be a little and and, and, and sometimes you don't have a farmer sometimes the farmer doesn't have selling skills. He's just really good at growing. So right. you have a guy that grows it for him. I mean, he sells it for him. So, you know, we all got our purpose. And, and, and it just that to me was like the shittiest argument when it came to like uh, being mad about uh, non legal or legalization per se, because the more uh, legal per se it is, the, the more law abiding we are. The more we just want to follow the rules. Right. We're not trying to, you know. <laughs> It's not a. Uh, yeah, we're uh, not following the shiny object around, man. Everybody's bobbing yeah. and weaving. What's the shiny object? Oh, it's Delta Eight. All right, it's it's Delta Nine. Oh, it's you know all these yeah. things are just chasing it around, you know, like dabs and this and that, and yeah. you know, basically, I just want to smoke a good joint and the to get me through the day and and live my life, and you know, that's that's kind of what we're doing here on our farm right now. You know, as far as work goes, it's been. And it's been rough. All the big money's out of the industry. All that early money that came in, you know, and yeah. they were throwing money around all over the place. Well, that stuff's come to a halt. And, uh, you know, so I do a little bit of expert witness stuff. I do some consulting here and there. Uh, it's been, it's been thin years for me. I'm, I'm, you know, I think my next chance will be uh, schedule three. Because everybody thinks Schedule Three is just going to be, you know, no, uh, they're not they're going to be able to get rid of the taxes, the tax issue, and they're going it's going to be. But no, I think it's going to be a pharmaceutical handoff, and we've been mm. talking about this pharmaceutical handoff uh, since the '90s. You know, we yeah. were talking about, you know, if it's legal or they reschedule it, then all they're doing is handing it to the pharmaceutical companies to deal with. And then everything else is out of the question. So I remember even at the rallies with Seattle Hemp Fest, as we're marching down the street, everybody's going, reschedule. I'm going, no, 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 deschedule, deschedule, yeah. deschedule, because anything else is just a big handoff. And yeah. I'm in a kind of unique position if it does go schedule three that there may be some opportunities for me since i've been vetted to grow and process cannabis by the federal government i did this work with them and stuff so you know i i'm not i'm not banking on it but you know if it happens you know i could see myself as a board member somewhere along the line for workplace oh, health sure. and safety or some you know and and i would be i would be cool with that you know, oh, just yeah. as long as I really want to keep, make sure we are able to hold on to home grow that, you know, the reason we started all this so we could grow our own weed and take care of ourselves. Oh yeah. Well, I think it's essential for genetics and everything else too. Right. I mean, right. If you're going to limit uh, uh, the, the market on this plant on this wonderful, you know, you don't, you don't have like broccoli being cornered, you, you know, no. you don't. You know, tomatoes? You My know, tomatoes? No, no, no. <laughs> you know? Big, <laughs> big orange juice hasn't come out and, and limit the... Uh, so, I, I, yeah, home grow is definitely essential to both the... You know, the and also the understanding of just the existence of, like, the... Like, you know, like you are saying, uh, these schedule would be... Or not these... Or unscheduled. Like getting off the goddamn thing overall, right? Like, like, like alcohol. Where's alcohol yeah. on the damn thing, right? Like... 
like well we want to be able to sell it like tomatoes you know if i have a little yeah. farm stand i want to have be able to have a sack there or a bag of leaves you know mm -hmm. for people to juice and then in the winter time i'd have a, like a you know you could buy your sack of weed along with your carrots and your beets and your winter yeah. greens and you know just like a one-stop shop for health can you imagine i don't know if you've seen them i'm pretty sure they are where you're at the in Whidbey Island, there used to be these uh, flower stands where people would like just put flowers and bouquets, and right? Would le leave like money in a little bucket for them, right? And, uh, uh, man, that'd be great to like just grab a, an eighth or two, you know, whatever, right? Almost. Just like just like eggs too. I mean, I've seen the egg stands too doing that, but uh, uh, yeah, but you know that, that's the thing. So like, ideally, yeah, get it off the fucking thing. But the the problem I think is kind of like here in Washington State where. Uh, the, for 502, you know, there was that five nanogram bullshit law, right? Like the DUI shit. And and it's like, it seems to be, there's got to be like a, a boogeyman or like a, a a good warm fuzzy feeling like, look, America, we're, we're taking care of you. We're, we're, we're just not, we're not going to rush into this. Cause I, I mean, the skip street would, I, I know would put it in farmer's hands as far as like uh Mark, you know, as far as like uh license structures go, but I think also with these existing uh, recreational markets, now you got to try and consider like there's got to be a, a middle ground, right? Like there's got to be some sort of like uh, conditional license or something that for for the states uh, that you know, like or even sweeping. I mean, federally, it's going to be a it's going to be a clusterfuck. I mean, it's not like it's a clusterfuck right now, right? I mean, like, right. <laughs> I mean it's going to be it's going to be if it goes schedule three, it'll be more of a clusterfuck. You think, you think you think you think there's a black market now you wait till they go schedule three and you can only get it from a pharmacy you know right well yeah that's uh, that's definitely i mean that that, that definitely I, mean, I got a shit ton of seeds that would make a lot of money right away right but we gotta but hold like, on to we gotta just like we were saying we gotta hold on to home grow or some yes. sort of medical ex exemption because everybody yes. uses yeah. it for medicinal purposes if you think about it from the common worker who busts his ass off in construction or whatever his high stress job is, because yeah. they're all stressful. He wants to come home. He wants to smoke some blue dream with his wife. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Get up the next morning and do it all over again. And cannabis gives you the opportunity to do that without oh, yeah. being stressed out of your mind and, and losing your mind. It gives you, it calms you down. It puts you in a state of peacefulness where, you know, you don't want to, you know, go ring yeah. your boss's neck. <laughs> <laughs> what? And did you see Ukraine just approved it for the soldiers that uh, they're fighting war? So, you know, uh, I think yeah, cannabis does help. It's like a uh, it helps uh, kind of quiet that little subconscious part that wants to speak out. Those intrusive voices, you know, <laughs> you're just like, hey, man, we're not we're not doing that right now. <laughs> when I started, <laughs> when I first started smoking, my whole deal is I had really bad dreams and I had a lot of anxiety as a kid and it just really calmed down and it shut mm. off the bad, you know, the, the bad dreams I was having as a kid. Okay. And, uh, so it was, it's always been really medicinal for me. Um, you know, I first smoked in Coronado on the top of a 11 story or yeah, like 15 story building and the air conditioner thing up there. And that's kind of how my story <laughs> went. My buddy Phil came up and said, yeah, my brothers, they're going up to the top of the building to smoke some weed and drink some alcohol. And I go, fuck, I'll go try this weed stuff. So they're nice. passing the tequila. Around. I'm not drinking. I'm just like wetting my lips, but I'm like on that fucking joint. You right know, on. <laughs> and then once I smoked and I went, oh, yeah, this is what I've been looking for. Now, if I can have this for the rest of my life, I think I can get through my life, man. I think yeah. my life is doable at that point. And then I got out. I was on the top of the world and I looked out to, to the beautiful Pacific Ocean and down towards Tijuana, Mexico and up towards Point Loma and just said, wow, I got to I got to do this. So my next move was. That fall when I went back to school, I bought a can of weed, you know, a can can of weed? like a Folgers coffee can of weed. And back oh, then, you take the lid off, and that was the lid. They pull out a handful, pull it on the lid, and that was the lid. It usually fit into, oh my God. Uh, into a baggie. And then I thought, well, if I, if I learn how to roll joints, I'll always have something to smoke because people are always looking for papers back then and somebody who knew how to roll a joint. And so I took that whole can of weed 
and yeah. I broke it all up. I remember I did it in a shoebox lid and, you oh, know, yeah. credit carded the, or carded up all the seeds and all the sticks down to the end. And I forced, I rolled the whole thing up and I was giving them away and I sold a few and, Bam, there I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's off, to the, off to the races. Man, it sounds like you just like totally described like a 70s scene with the, the shoebox. Oh, it was. Or... We were in my buddy's, I remember we were in my buddy's uh, a bedroom listening to Peter Frampton. Oh, my God. Way what back I... then. Way back then. You know, was that was that brickweed then? If, that, if you were separating somebody, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was big, it was brickweed back then. But yeah, then yeah. I started looking for good weed, you know. So I found this place called Mount Helix in San Diego, in La Mesa. And mm -hmm. it was this place where this cross was, and there was a park up there. But yeah. you could see when the cops were coming up. So everybody, it was like a rock church where it's okay. all made out of rocks because San Diego's really rocky. So they would pull out yeah. these rocks and they had a place where they would stash their weed when the cops came and they'd had lookouts and stuff like that. And oh but I God. found the guy who supplied everybody there. And who had the best weed, you know, and it was the guy who showed up. It was the guy who showed up with the metal toolbox. And you okay. know what? I still have that toolbox. Oh, shit, dude. I wow. have the original toolbox that he used to bring all the weed in. I've got nice. it in my garage. I came across it one time. Uh, we he had lit, he eventually ended up living at my house <laughs> with uh, with me and my dad in the 90s and you know he i go he was gonna throw it away or something i go man i'm gonna keep that and he goes what i go yeah this is history <laughs> for me right here that yeah, metal yeah, yeah. craftsman toolbox like emptied out with all kinds of bags of, of different herbs in it a little scale right. like he had it he had it oh dialed in. well i'd bring all those old memories you know make my, the hairs on my i got chicken skin you know makes the hairs on my arms stand up again well, it's a different time, you know. I mean, that's a uh, uh, well, you know, you see a lot of older heads who get mad about legalization being like, uh, uh it's gonna you know, happen, man. Yeah, these people yeah. aren't going to jail as much anymore, you know. Like, and it, yeah. the police right now have so many other things to do, you know, like well, all the robberies and people are stealing cars and the homeless issue and stuff. Those guys' plates are way full, they don't have, yeah. they don't have time to bust people for smoking a joint. Yeah, but you know what? They don't, right. and it's not even worth their time to do it. Yeah, but the thing is, like, none of this shit's new. You know, all the no. all this bad, all this bad shit. It just means, like, now, hey, uh, uh, go focus on the real bad people, the real bad crime, the real. And the thing is, you know, I think people have this like image of their head of like cops, you know, being like, uh, like they're in it to to for justice. They're in it for like, uh, you know, and there might be some are, but it's also like. Like in the military, people have this like weird hang up. They think that everybody who fucking went in the military did it to like, you know, America. But a lot of times you just need a job. You know, right. I'm one of them. No <laughs> doubt. Know? I get it. it is, yeah. I, I grew so, up in San Diego, military town. We had the Marines and the Navy yeah. and you name it. We we had it there. We even had the Air Force there too. Miramar Naval Air Station. Oh, that was a Navy Air Station. But yeah, we're like Top Gun yeah, flights were know. and you know, yeah. and I grew up around military people and they were always looking for weed and they always needed somebody to be able to roll the joint who had paper. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the fact that you, you worked with Brown Mary, man, that Brown Mary, that, that you've been doing this for a long ass time. Like, like she was a badass. Like, like, oh, like, yeah. Yeah. She went like, on national TV, like during her bust, you know, and that's how we got the idea to carry our media list with them. Like every one of the patients, anything went down at their private house or whatever instantly yeah. because they all, the news people gave us all the information said marijuana is a hot topic. Anything happens to you guys, man, we want to cover it. So, okay. you know, we had our list and, and my wife used it, used it. And she, man, she saved my life that day because without exposure, they whisk you away to jail. Nobody knows about it. Then they, 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 you know, charge you. Then they yeah. send you off to prison before, and nobody even knows. Like I, you know, I just, I was a surfer, so I just wanted to surf, you know, smoke <laughs> yeah, weed, surf, right. skateboard, you know, golf on the rainy days. But everything had to do with weed. Weed always made oh, everything yeah. better, more enjoyable, more fun, more everything. So. To me, it was, you know, and what reason I wanted legalization because, dang it, 
that guy always took so long to show up with the toolbox with all the weed in it and waiting around for these guys. And I'm like thinking, oh, the waves are fucking firing right now, you know, <laughs> or we could be, or if the waves weren't good, we could be skateboarding this ditch or off to the, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. new ditch or, or skateboard place that we were, you know, we used to go to the community concourse and skate down the parking lot and do all kinds nice. of in the middle of the night, man. But we'd always made things a lot better. Oh yeah. And I, and I think though, and that's how I see things too, is like, like uh, I've always wanted weed to just have that. Like you, you always think like, like, like uh, weed and like, if you were to travel overseas, like, well, even like when I was in the military, I was like, I'd be in Australia and I'd be like, Oh man, I wish I could smoke weed here. Or I got hit up in Hong Kong, dude. And I was like, how the fuck do I get some some uh, uh, Chinese guy with dreadlocks fucking goes, you want? I was like, I mean, I had my uniform on. I was like, how do I, how do I look like the weed? But yes, I do, but I can't. Right. Um, but it would be awesome. Uh, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, like, we would definitely, or even like as these uh, new countries knock things out, Mexico's getting their shit kind of together. I mean, they did some decriminalization, but I think more of their culture is in Mexico City, which is centralized. And right. like, which is crazy because, like, you can go to like Cabo, Cancun, all these fun spots, get all the fucking cocaine or ecstasy you want. But right. you're like, trying to find good weed. You'll right. find shitty weed, but you're not going to find, you know, a, a nice. They had a of lot of shitty weed down there. You know, I happen to have connections that grew up in the hills above between like Tijuana and Ensenada and along the coast, there was mountains that came down from the mountain range there and mm -hmm. uh, they grew up in the hills up there. So every December we would see nice green buds with no seeds in it that came across the border, Ooh, you know, nice. and that, that was my bread and butter for years. I, I would, uh, I had a guy who would buy it all up and then he'd milk it out to us during the year. But yeah. back then, you know, when I hit my 20s, I wanted everybody was going to Hollywood. I go, fuck, I'll go to Hollywood. Sounds like a yeah. good time. And I kind of just uh, paid my way by running pounds up and then sell selling three grams for 20 bucks. And then I had a group of jazz musicians who would show up at my apartment every morning at eight o'clock or seven, between seven and eight, and buy everything yeah. I had for sale that day because I had to regulate myself for sale oh because i could sell it all but then yeah, i'd yeah. have to go back to san diego and i didn't need that much money you know because rent was like a it was like 75 dollars <laughs> and then going to the beach for the day and then going out having some beers at the frolic room or the yeah, firefly yeah. and hanging out with my friends was only so much money it really didn't need a lot you know i made so much and I spent my uh, winters in Hollywood doing my thing there. And then my yeah. summers I spent in Baja at a surf camp, a lobster village that I've been going to since I was a kid. And I'd spent six months down there just because Hollywood was so stressful and hectic. And then yeah. I go spent six months with pretty much by myself and the husband and wife there and their uh, brothers who were the lobster fishermen. And I was like the cap, uh, camp ranger there. So I spent a lot of time by myself down there and really enjoyed it. Surfed a lot by myself, caught uh, more waves than, man, any person should able, be able to catch. And uh, yeah, I kind of just like, I grew up in a place called Allied Gardens, you know, like the Allied Forces. And yeah. it was a bunch of retired, you know, Navy guys and Marines and stuff like that. And, you know, I saw them at 60 years old. And they were all beat to hell and yes. tired, and and I'm going, man. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's the plan for me. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna like go as hard as I can, serve as much as I can, grow as much weed as I can, go go go. I really wasn't a deadhead like so many yeah. people in the cannabis industry. They're deadheads and they follow the dead around. And God love them all. They're really good friends of mine. But for yeah. me, it was it was surfing and growing weed and sure. going skateboarding and going on trips and doing this and that, all athletic stuff, because I knew by the time the, they, the society wants you to retire at 65, oh, yeah. you think you're going to be able to skateboard or, you know, trek around the world, surfing all over yeah. the place. <laughs> by then, your body's all beat up from working your whole life. <laughs> so it's what? kind of been a, you know... It's, still money trying to regulate what people do and how they live their lives and yeah. they try to make it normal you know even from the classroom 
the ringer go the bells go off to get you in the <laughs> class and then you need to sit orderly <laughs> in your class and do your work your homework yeah. your school work right and then from there, you transition to the job where you do the job work, where you're orderly, where the bells go off and regulate you and kind of train you. And then and then throw this carrot at the end of the line saying, yeah, here's a carrot. Just think when you're 65 or 60, you could be doing nothing. You know what I mean? And hold this carrot. But by the time people get there, especially with the adulterated food out there, people are <laughs> and bad and bad medicine. People are. You know, about ready to die then. You know, there's no oh, yeah. life left in them. And that's kind of a rip off of people's lives. I think it's theft of the worst kind is you know, stealing somebody's freedom to enjoy their life. Well, we, we work to live, unfortunately, right? And, and right. Then, or live to work, depending on how you look at what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, But you, it's funny that you, you mentioned two things you mentioned was, one, how the guy would only uh, throughout the, the year give you a little bit. And then how you yourself would buy a large amount and then you don't have to sell it all right away. Um, you know, this is all before like proper storage days and everything. I mean, we all did our own like thoughts, like jars, perhaps in the freezer. You know, we all want to try, you know, figure out how we store, right. you know, the large amount of products, um, you know, but uh, uh, you could do that back then. Right. That was because I don't think you could do that even now, in, in, at least in California, like the cost of weed and the competition that that's out there. I, I mean, at least the way I see things uh, when it comes to risk, like like here in Washington State, I uh, I had a young guy. Uh, he gives me this or I, I bought this. Uh, uh, some shit was shipped to him from Cali. Uh, it's a half cart live rosin. And I got a quarter of weed for 75 bucks. And then yeah. I had to go drive, drive my ass down an hour drive to go to this guy's house. I'm just doing it because he was family. Right. But, but like I bought a $65, uh, ten, uh, I got a quarter and a fucking $10 fucking live rosin uh, dab. And it's like, dude, you're, you're, you're competing against a market. That's not, it's not good. Like when I used to sell, uh, you know, I was thinking there was a point where I was able to pay my rent. I was, I was doing college selling, and uh, I made just enough to pay my rent. At the same time, right. I had a job. I had a uh, fucking like uh, a mall job. So like like a, everything worked out. I was ahead and, and doing things. But like, there's a point where you're like, you know what? I want more. But how do I get more? Oh, I gotta sell pounds instead of fucking like ounces. And, and yeah, and, and that's where you start like raising the eyebrows and and, and yeah, getting, I really wasn't into it because I was. You know, I'd sell enough so I could get more and, and then take care of my basic needs. I was really never selling in it just, just to sell it and make money and sell it to make money. No, I, I sold it to be able to, for me to live the lifestyle I wanted to live. Yeah. You know, it was more, it was a lifestyle choice and it was an avenue that I could pay my bills. You know, I hung out with a bunch of band members all the time and I used to get all the chicks because they would go, you're not a band member. You mean you don't have to go to band practice and all this drama? And I go, no, you know, and I, I grow and I, I, you know, I, I sell weed and they go, oh, you sell weed, you know, that was, that was, that was my deal in Hollywood. You know, like, like yeah. the girls were sick of the band drama and they wanted to hang out with the guy who smoked weed. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> So uh, when you were out here in, in Washington, so one of the last, like as the, as the the medical was dying or flourishing, you know, and it could have been depending on what perspective you're looking at, because some people really did really well, became MSOs, and some people got fucked really hard and put all their hopes and dreams and got burnt out. But like, um, try, oh yeah, so like during medical times, one of the earlier brands that I saw, like, so I saw people starting to do interstate stuff, like they weren't. Some, you know, some they would say they weren't traveling across, say, I don't care, but right. like Chiba Chews. Like I saw right. them in stores in, in Oregon or in Oregon, uh, California, and I saw them in, uh, in Washington. And I was like, huh, that's like one of the first ones I saw. But then I was talking to people, growers, and people were doing that circuit pretty much of going up and down the coast. Were you involved in any of that or were you pretty much just like a Washingtonian, like, no, this I did is... things in California. I had like seven years that I kind of just went under under a little bit undercover because I, if I got arrested again, they were going to throw the book on me and it was going to be, since we got busted for 448 plants, it was going to be like this federal deal. And, 
you know, I just met my wife and all I really mm. wanted to do too is, you know, I was into farming and agriculture because I did landscaping my whole life. Um, along with, you know, I did landscaping my whole life. So I wanted to grow my own food. We wanted to grow our own weed. And I kind of just kept to, to myself one, you know, once I, uh, once I heard about the farmer's markets, then I started jumping into the farmer's market scene up here. And, that's, that's, you know, and, yeah. Well, okay. No, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying that's where I learned about people who are doing the, uh, the coastal thing. We're at the farmer's markets, right? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. People are running stuff all over the place. Yeah. Well, even the ones that were running the market, I know, uh, they were trying the, um, uh, they were trying to do the same thing, like 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 uh, what's the big emerald thing that happens in the uh, um, oh California? emerald cut, yeah. So yeah. like that's a you know there's a there's a old culture still involved there, right? The people who right. actually had to like do things by a handshake or uh, uh, you know like or or physical violence, you know. What I mean like that's pre lawsuit days, right? Like right pre pre like you know I can screw you through paperwork type shit now, you know like. Yeah, um, it's 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 bad out, but there still is a lot of legacy out there. That was kind of the whole purpose of uh, my YouTube page. Heroes, I did a Farmer Tom Canacast, and I have a series called Heroes of the Green. I, you know, did one. Of, I interviewed you. I interviewed a hundred people, and they're, you know, I thought it was great, a good idea to capture their stories before they passed on, and. Yeah, no. uh, uh, yeah, so there's there's like 35 in there in there right now. Go check them out. They're all my heroes. They're they're I, I do it a little bit differently. I you know open this open it up, tell them who they are, and then they get to tell their whole story uninterrupted. Because unlike you, but a lot of these podcast guys, they just want to hear themselves talk all the time. <laughs> so I thought I'd just give them, hey, you just tell your whole story totally uninterrupted. Have at it. I'll record it. And then I'll get it out there on the, on the internet. But, you know, um, and this is the first time in history that we re really been able to record people's stories, like regular people record yeah. people's stories, video and audio. So I took advantage of that and got a zoom account and did it and recorded like a hundred of them. Sometimes I was doing three weeks. Sometimes I was doing two week. I had to do something to keep me busy, you know, because after COVID and stuff and, you know, they're, you know, I had farming to do, but the winter, there's not a lot going on on the farm. Well, there's a, so, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories though, man. I mean, like, yeah, uh, I, um, you know, my, so I had two Facebook accounts. The one that I have presently, uh, was my, the family account, which I was using for like my mom and, uh, right. like sister and shit. And then I was using like this activist account that I, uh, was using for trolling pretty much, you know, trolling right, I remember. Or, yeah, you know, so like. That account, though, when I lost it, I had it for 10 years when I lost it. Uh, there were so many people that I cannot friend again because they died, right? Like, there's, oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many cannabis activists. I mean, Seattle Ham Fest is losing somebody every fucking year, right? Um, month, you know? And, uh, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of heroes, you know? And I saw that, like, people, like, you don't even know at the time, right? Like, everybody knows Jack Hare. But no one knows, like, like Adam Dunn. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of people know who he is because he's got a show, yeah. and you know, he's been. But like, when I learned about who he was, I was like, oh shit! Like, there's a subculture. Like, I always was like focused on like the high times people back in the day when I was younger because I thought that was the culture, right? I thought Stephen Hager and uh, Steve Bloom because I look at the editors and I was like, man, he's. I want to work for these guys. So this is the ass I got to kiss, right? Like, this is how I got to think, and this is how I got to figure out things. But uh, then you learn it's just a fucking business. It's just a thing that. Uh, Steven Hager, if you ever go to his YouTube channel, he's got some pretty cool, like behind the scenes. He was one of the first people like document, like, like video shit and do internet things. Right. Um, and his smart ass, um, owns all the rights. So like when he did it with high, high times, can't take it away from him. Like that's his media, uh, all the high times cups. He was the guy pretty much behind all those ones. Nice. Um, he did the live stream and shit. Um, so there's like a lot of people involved in like just a, the evolution of now people just go to the fucking store and, 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 and you know I mean? It's not even, but a, you got to remember, time. you got to remember people like Allison Bigelow. You've yes. got Paul Sanford who uh, won, won a case against the government. 
you know, which like the yeah. first one. You've got people like Carrie Boyder and Sharon Whitson and my Vivian McPeak and my buddy Jim from the Herbivores, Jim Matheson mm. from the Herbivores. And you've got yeah. all these legends still around. And I thought, what an opportunity, man. If I can get all their stories uninterrupted, this will be great. I've yeah. done Adam Dunn too. I've done a, you know, real one, a, you know, the hip hop guy, uh, like, uh, like all my old friends that really needed recognition and who really never got it. Once legalization happened, everybody forgot about it, you know, yeah. and the activists that did it, that did all the work. There's no money in activism. There's no, no 401k plan for you. You, and you're out there doing good service for the community, but the, the stores aren't hiring these people. They tried for a second yeah. You know, but then, you know, something happened and they're not working there anymore. And, you know, all these people went to jail, died, risked yes. their lives so people could people could have cannabis and smoke it. And it's really a tragedy that uh, the, w the way it's went, you know, that all these people are forgotten. So that's another reason for my Heroes of the Green is to remember these guys. So uh, they, yeah. you know. They're remembered for the work that they did because there was so much critical work to get to the legalization point. These uh, the legalized people, especially the multi-state operators, the people with money, they have no clue what went into legalizing cannabis and normalizing. Well, they have no idea whatsoever. All the work, sleeping on couches, you know, hit, bumming rides here trying to get collect gas money to go to the state capitol, not yeah. being able to pay your bills because you're out there doing advocacy work, you know, and you're going, you know, do I pay my bills or do I go do advocacy work? And, you know, sometimes you just threw it to the wind and when did the <laughs> advocacy work? Because, you know, it was so important. It's something you were yeah. passionate about. And to see these basically thieves come in and steal our industry from them is pretty screwed up and they do it you know, without thinking about anybody and really could care less about anything. And since it's all profit driven, they'll, they'll adulterate the product and sell, sell an inferior product without blinking an eye. And yeah. it's not like they do, they have a conscious or, or anything. And like when they're dying and laying there, are they thinking about all the people they screwed over and their life no. to get there? Or are they thinking about all the good deeds that they did for their community and stuff like that? Well, I want to be on that side. I think yeah. I think that's the side, you know, where you die in peace. And I think that's heaven and hell. Either you can have a lot of guilt because you took advantage of all these people, just blatantly ripped them off, lie, cheat, and steal, or you were a good guy playing by the rules, doing the best you can to make the world a better place. And at the end of the day, yeah. you know, I you know, I'll, I sleep better at night. And, you know, the reason I've guiding my life the way I do is because I want to sleep well at night. I don't want to look yeah. over my back. I don't want to look over my shoulder. I don't want all that stress in my life, you know? Well, and it's great that you got, like, the ear of, like, actual government entities that can, like, actually help with, like, actual real regulation of the plant. Not not the see to sell shit. It's the it's actually the rules involved that, like, the workers' rights. And to me, uh, I'm an advocate of just, like, make sure – if the plant was mandatory, just testing, right? And then you just like say, these are all the test requirements, right? We don't have as much fucking regulation for cigarettes, let alone, uh, uh, you know, like, and I'm just asking for bed minimum, just, just test the, the product and, and let the consumer know. People do smoke cigarettes. They will smoke shitty weed. They'll smoke shit with freaking pesticides in it. Oh, yeah. You know, if it's cheap enough and or whatever, there's always a market for these things. But I just think they're so isolated and, and, and they do take advantage of the community right and i think it's good that people like you who have the experience and even like the my lawyer tom dude he he grows so he has on hand experience too i i don't grow i i wish i could i just don't have the time uh i've tried uh the only time i do have time to grow is when it's sunny outside so then i can like, you know nature takes you, course. I, over the years <laughs> i've seen you give it a shot your your best shot yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're okay. Sometimes it's it's hemp. <laughs> it's, you know? it's it's fun to do, and you get really attached yeah. to the plants, and it's super good for you. You know, like yes. after I get home from a big trip, I'll say hi to my wife real quick, and then I'll run straight to my plants because <laughs> I, I just want to see them, and I want, yeah, and then I want to see them to make sure they're okay too. You know what I mean? Are, are yeah. they okay? Do I've got bugs? 
what do I have to take care of right away? Because you know what happens with plants. If you see some sort of issue and if you don't act immediately, the next oh, yeah, time yeah. you come back, you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah. So, 100%. You know, no, that, that's exactly what I, it is, I, man. I, I'm thankful for my wife, you know, for uh, putting up with me and my love for cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like your wife uh, has a love for it, too. So, Oh, she does. She does. Yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. So. So you got so everybody can find you here at the the Farmer Tom Canacast, right? Yeah, Farmer Tom Canacast. I'm you know Farmer Tom Tom Lowerman on Facebook, um, Farmer Tom Lowerman on Instagram, I'm Farmer Tom I'm Farmer Tom on X, and LinkedIn I'm Farmer Tom Lowerman there too. So those are the only one. Those are the kind of the pools I swim in as far as my social media goes. Um, yeah, and I'm working with Brandon Palmer now from Dope Magazine. Remember the Dope oh, Hack, right. Dope Magazine, all that stuff. We've got What's some stuff. We, we got some stuff cooking. You know, it's my yeah, 50 yeah. years of cannabis this year. I started in, you know, 1973 when I was 12 years old, and Goddamn. you know, so it's been yeah. 50 years for me. So this is kind of a big deal for me this year, and you know, I was proud of the work that I did with Leafly and the Workers Resource page this year, and I'm Dude. really looking to forward to 20, 2024 because hey man I, you know i just keep my head up and stay stay focused and you know do my best to bring a little light to every situation and you know have a, a joyous vision of the future and because oh, yeah. there's a lot of craziness in the world right now and a lot of scary <laughs> stuff going on but i know that the only you know my imagination is is the most powerful thing i have so I really want to use my imagination and my visualization and my thinking good thoughts and my moving forward in life. I mean, I believe that's how, you know, all my success uh, doing what I've done for cannabis has really happened because of my spiritual practices and eating healthy and smoking good herb and drinking a lot of water. And, you know, when my mind starts to go crazy, I just, you know, pretty much tell myself, you know, What's going on right now? Today, 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 right now, right now, right now, right now. And that's yeah. really the only thing you have control of is this second and this moment in life. So as long as I can do that, I think great things are going to come in the future. I'm looking forward to continuing working with Brandon Palma and the crew that I that I do. I'm blessed to have my family super supportive. Like without my family, <laughs> You know, I, I just got to thank my like my sister and her husband and Paula and Christine and all these people in my life and my neighbors and everybody believing in me and the work that I do because yeah. we really were ad advocates. We really couldn't have got through all these years and still being on our farm with without this group of loving oh, yeah. people who see how passionate I am about the plan and believe in me and the work that I that I'm doing. So I kind of take that by the reins and. Write it. Right on, dude. I'm glad you met your family because uh, the only reason why I was like, I mean, I know you get the vibe, but like my fucking wife and my kid both <laughs> open the door like five minute intervals. I'm all like, what? What? I got right. shit. I mean, <laughs> but again, I told you, it's like, you know, we'll get a good conversation in. I mean, uh, and it's still much more to talk about, but like, uh, you really guys, people should check out Farmer Tom. I mean, he's the only farmer Tom I think that should be allowed in cannabis, but like, I'm sure, you know, you got the branding dude, the, the, you know, you got the, the, the Santa Claus vibe going. I mean, that the whole thing is just rocking. Uh, and I, and, well, and thank also, you, man. Thanks. Thanks for believing in me, man. I thank all my friends like Brandon and my family and all my friends for, for believing in me. And it keeps, it keeps me going. And, you know, I live to smoke another day and that's all we can ask. Right. Hell yeah, brother. And on that note, I'm going to end this broadcast and then we can chat for a second real quick. All right, so, bro. Thank you so much, Maggie, for having me on the show. Super appreciate it. Yeah, man. Appreciate you, man. 